Welcome to week three. We are going to discuss characteristics of vulnerability. The learning outcomes for this uh, module are to describe the characteristics of vulnerable groups, to discuss the risk factors that lead to inadequate health care and poor health outcomes within the U.S., as well as to articulate the importance of implementing transcultural competence into nursing practice. And you will see that this is part one of uh, two videos. The second video will focus on that third outcome. Within the U.S., what are the risk factors that can lead to inadequate health care and poor health outcomes? Take a moment to think about that. What do you think are the key factors that influence a person's ability to get um, good health care? The three that we're going to talk about this week are race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and health insurance. And you will see that there is a cycle um, beginning with the very first risk factor just being a part of a, a racial or ethnic minority. Um, this group tends to have um, a greater barrier in obtaining higher education. Uh, we know that education in itself can lead to higher paying jobs. So uh, that if someone is not highly educated, it leads to employment that is in a lower wage job. We also know that low wage jobs are less likely to have health insurance. Um, if they do offer health insurance, it's usually at a very high premium. And we also know, especially working in healthcare, that lack of health insurance not only reduces access to health care services, uh, but many times prevents people from um, utilizing uh, the available services. It says, without adequate access to care, health problems go untreated. Uh, the person will continue to ignore the problems as long as they can, uh, and then they will need to go in and get treatment when it becomes uh, of the chronic or more severe nature. There are several examples of this um, in the nickel and dimed book. Um, and you, if you remember back to some situations where Barbara, um, her co-workers uh, in some of the different employment settings um, did not have access to health insurance. It was not even available to them and they had to leave some of their health issues go untreated. Untreated problems create more barriers to education or employment achievement. Uh, these employees are very fearful that they will end up losing their job. Um, so they continue to go to work and the problems continue to uh, become more significant. And then you can see how this cycle just continues um, throughout the circles here. Over the course of the last decade, the former U.S. Surgeon General work to place the elimination of racial and ethnic disparities at the top of the nation's health agenda. Uh, and based on that information, how do you think we're doing? Um, are we able to meet some of those needs or do we still have many issues um, with disparities amongst uh, racial and ethnic minority groups? Uh, we know that minority race and ethnicity um, have shown to predict poor health status uh, as well as poor access to care uh, and poor quality of care. If you think of that word minority, uh, in the U.S. it's quickly becoming inapplicable. Um, the projection of the population growth uh, based on race and ethnicity um, is going to completely reshape the demographic picture of the United States. Uh, by 2050, they're actually making a projection that there will be no minority um, race, that instead there will be two minority groups that together um, make up the majority. So it's referred to as a majority minority. And you'll be able to see it from uh, these two pie graphs. In 2010, uh, the majority, which is the 65%, the blue area, um, was uh, held by the white non-Hispanic group. Um, that group 
almost doubles by 2050. And you'll see a reduction in the white non-Hispanic group. So neither of these groups, um, if the predictions hold true, will be in the, ma in the majority uh, by 2050. One of the theories behind racial and ethnic differences in healthcare um, is that they are uh, attributed to difference in socioeconomic status. Uh, when we try to define what socioeconomic economic status consists of, um, it's the incorporation of three measures, the first being income. So when you think of someone's economic status, it's their income, uh, as well as their education and their occupation. So socioeconomic status consists of income, education, and occupation. And those three measures um, are what provides a broader picture of a person's status in a community as well as in a bigger society. Individuals with the greatest financial resources have the greatest ability to access care. Um, you think of surgeries that are emergency sur surgeries versus those that are elective. Um, and who has access to elective surgeries? Um, does an individual who doesn't have uh, health insurance or has uh, lower economic status, do they really have a choice uh, if something is an elective surgery or do they have to wait until the issue becomes an emergency? emergency. Um, also we know that income translate into purchasing power, um, not just uh, you know what can you do as far as buying a home or buying a car or putting your own children or yourself through school, um, but with health care as well. This income becomes a part of a larger concept of social position. Understanding poverty thresholds are also important. Um, these thresholds are used by the government or government agencies to determine who is eligible for different assistance programs. And I have listed there several that are throughout the state, um, including Head Start, is which for it is for children uh, younger than school age who um, through uh, the different services that they provide can give them literally a head start on education uh, due to some limitations and uh, related disabilities. Uh, many times it will be a child who uh, was premature uh, and uh, so had some limited uh, or delayed uh, growth and development and so they want to give the child uh, a good chance to start school as uh, close to where they should be for their age as possible and so that program is very valuable. Uh, there's also the food stamp program, national school lunch program um, where once again, students um, whose families can't afford the cost of school lunches um, can receive assistance, but that is based on that poverty threshold, um, and that is determined through the government, and they say what the limited amount of income uh, a person can earn in order to receive these services. There's also energy assistance, and then there you see the Medicaid and CHIP program. Socioeconomic status has many significant impacts on health. Um, you know, because of that, we need to also consider other influential um, factors uh, that can cause barriers. And part of that is considering the envir environment where an individual lives. Um, the in an environment or the place of residence influences uh, three different areas, um, and that is income, education, and occupation. So consider, um, you know, maybe one of your clients uh, and that you've had in the past who might live in a low socioeconomic uh, area. They may live in uh, reduced housing sectors, they may live on the streets, um, and how that influences um, their health and their health care. Uh, it says, in the U.S., your place of residence dictates where your child goes to school, and um, we do know that schools who have concentrated uh, percentages of poverty uh, end up having lower average test scores. Uh, those school districts in particular are more restricted uh, in the curriculum that they can offer students because uh, the tax base is not there. 
Um, they also have higher dropout rates uh, and uh, than the regular public uh, schools, which are situated in middle class neighborhoods. It says residence also dictates employment opportunities. It says is there access to convenient and well-paying entry-level jobs. Um, so once again, if someone's on the street and they want to apply uh, for a position and they need to list an address, where are they going to list? If you list a homeless shelter, um, you have less of a chance of uh, receiving that employment. Income and education are strongly correlated, uh, more highly educated educated individuals generally earn higher wage jobs. Um, like income, education attainment is, is uh, unequally distributed across demographic groups. Uh, similar disparities are noticed in education attainment um, as well as uh, according to gender. Uh, there's also some disparities. Occupation is closely tied to income and education. In general, higher education is associated uh, with your ability to obtain higher level occupations with higher salaries and, of course, greater benefits. As with income and education, there are differences in unemployment rates. Low income jobs rarely provide health insurance and private insurance fees are just too high uh, for families uh, struggling with low incomes. We know that levels of income, education, and occupation together characterize a person's what we would say position along that socioeconomic gradient. With that in mind, how does this position affect health outcomes or someone's health care experience? Consider the individuals you spoke about in your application to practice papers. Once again, how does that position affect health outcomes and someone's health care experience? Did you know that the United States is the only developed country that does not yet guarantee all of its citizens access to health care through a, here's the keyword, a system of universal health coverage? Now, we know that Obamacare is the first step whether you agree with uh, the route that they're taking or not, but it is one of the first steps to provide coverage for all Americans. In 65, President Johnson enacted two uh, very significant health insurance programs, one of which is Medicaid, which we uh, talked about uh, briefly previously, and that is for our um, poor uh, families and individuals. Uh, Medicare is for our elderly. We also in 1997 um, were able to start a program called CHIP for children uh, and low-income families and then in 2008 um, despite these two uh, developments 15.4% of the population still was noted to not have health insurance. It'll be interesting to see what those results are uh, now that uh, Obamacare has been enacted. Something else to consider is the fact that many of our individuals have multiple risk factors. If you take a look at these um, circles and how they interconnect, you'll see, for example, um, out of the almost 30 percent of our population in the minority group and out of the 21.5% uh, who were in a low income group, 15% of them have both risk factors. If you take a look, you can look at these two risk factors together and the different percentages. So many of our population um, have not just one but multiple risk factors. Talks about in the U.S. Uh, the overlap of risk factors, the substantial portion of the population that has multiple risk factors, and then improving the quality of care um, for vulnerable populations um, requires a multifaceted clinical and policy intervention. Uh, it's not going to happen on its own.